Well, joining me now is the former royal bodyguard to Queen Elizabeth II, Simon Morgan, Princess Diana's former butler, Paul Burrell, and Fox News contributor, and New York Post columnist, Miranda Devine. Well, welcome to all of you. Uh, Miranda, let me start with you across the pond there. You and I know Manhattan very well. We've got a lot of yellow cabs in our time. Does any of this version of events from the Sussexes ring true to you? No. And the, the, they've just chosen the wrong place to try and pull this stunt because there are so many cameras in New York, there are so many celebrities, much more important than they are. Um, the carry-on just fell flat. Everybody knew that it was bogus. And it's obvious why they did it. They created the drama. They drove around Manhattan for an hour and a half to, to create some sort of event that mm. Harry was filming on his phone, um, presumably for the next Netflix instalment. And, uh, and now they're on the front page. No one even cared about Meghan Markle getting some award. It would have been sort of the bottom of page six. Now they're on the front page, yeah. which is what they wanted. And all I can say is life in Montecito must be incredibly boring. Yeah, <laughs> completely. Well, it is incredibly boring. We know that from the Netflix documentary. They, just, they basically walk around with a bunch of chickens and go and see Oprah Winfrey every yeah. 10 minutes. Um, all right, let me bring in Simon Morgan. You've been a bodyguard to the late, great Queen. You've seen a lot of paparazzi in your time. The rules here are much tighter yeah. in the UK, particularly since the death of Princess Diana, um, and quite rightly so. This couldn't have happened there. But in New York, you know, it's an epicentre of celebrity culture in America. I've been around a lot of big stars in New York where this kind of thing has gone on. It goes with the territory. Absolutely, it does. It's part as, as your security detail. That's going to be part of your plan. You, you accept you're going to have interaction with the press and you're going to look at that. What is your mitigation and what are your contingencies? If you had a 10-minute journey, Simon, right? This is literally a 10-minute journey. 57th Street to mid-70s, we think it was, in Upper East Side to a friend's house. If that was the journey, how could it possibly extend to two hours? I mean, that's the worrying factor because, you know, you are, you are on the move. You're out in the public domain. If it's a 10-minute journey, why let's not make it a 10-minute journey? That's the, that's the worrying bit as you're going around and around. And if you don't want the paparazzi to know where you're going, then don't go to a friend's house in New York when you're leaving a massive media event with 100 paparazzi outside. I mean, it's completely insane unless they were doing this deliberately. Again, that seems to be the crux of it. They didn't want to show up where they were staying, and that's caused part of the problem. But the cat and mouse game with the paparazzi, yeah. we, you know, back in 2008, 2009, you know, that's, a, that's a game you're not going to win, and we realised that at, at Royalty Protection. When they, the security decided to put them into a yellow cab, I mean, yellow cabs are no in New York are notorious for being, A, pretty reckless, and they speed a lot, um, but you don't know who the hell it is, right? And you're putting in some two of the most famous people in the world into the first yellow cab you see. Would any secure royal protection guy do that? Uh, no. You know, it's as simple as that because... It's unthinkable, right? It, it, that key part, that security driving piece, is actually a key part of your protection detail. Mm -hmm. Now you've put them in a, a yellow cab with someone that you don't know. And as a security professional, uh, your response to conflict comes in three phases, fight, flight or freeze. Freeze is removed from you because of the training and then you have two options, fight or flight. And, but what is that man going to do in that situation? He's had no formalised training in that role um, and he could be like a rabbit caught in headlights yeah. or he could fight when we want to flight or vice versa. That is the weakness of that particular decision. OK, Paul Burrell, you've been waiting patiently. You knew, obviously, Princess Diana and the boys extremely well. Um, that Harry is trying again to use what happened to his mother as justification mm. for his, you know, in my view, very over emotional in this case, uh, uh, over egging of the of the paparazzi souffle, saying, "Look, this was close to death, near catastrophe, blah blah blah." What do you feel when he invokes what happened to his mother in that Paris underpass? Do you understand well, it, or do you think he's doing this too much? I think it's too much, Piers. Um, I think this drama unfolding on the other side of the Atlantic is to make them more relevant again, is to bring them back into the public spotlight. And as our dear late Queen said, our recollections may vary, as you said in your intro. Mm. That's that's obviously what's happening here. Um, to make any comparison with a car chase in Paris, which took the princess's life, and one in Manhattan um, is really very sad. It's very sad, wrong, and distasteful. Um, they are total, two totally different circumstances. The princess, 
was actually um, avoiding the media as much as he could, could possibly avoid mm. the media on that night. And, and the reverse, Meghan and Harry were courting it. And so there are two different circumstances here. Nothing, nothing is, is similar other than photographs being taken. Um, I think it's very distaste, distasteful. There's clearly an incident here, but it's been blown out of all proportion. Well, it's an incident. It's an incident which the police said led, led to no uh, collision, yes. no arrests, right? I and mean, as far as they're concerned, you can tell by the language they use, they just don't yeah. think this was a big deal at all. No. Uh, Miranda, no. let me ask you about, just generally, about Meghan and Harry. They've obviously made their American bed and now have to lie in it. It's been a very lucrative bed, but they've torched their families, all their families, pretty much apart from Meghan's mother, is now out of the picture. Um, they don't seem very happy for people who were seeking happiness, but what is the American reaction to them now? I mean, it seems to me that more and more they're becoming a bit of a laughing stock. Yes. Yeah, utter contempt and uh, just sort of bemusement about why they're carrying on like this. It's not as if they are, you know, the biggest celebrities that have ever come to New York. And um, the South Park episode uh, really encapsulated it. You know, they're on this worldwide privacy tour, running around trying to get people's attention while saying, give me my privacy. And I think it, it you know, it stems from Meghan Markle's um, complete... Uh, fascination with fame and narcissism. She loves the paparazzi, she loves the cameras. And that's just the opposite of what Harry wants. Harry is, um, you know, deeply wounded by what happened to his mother and he's got into his head that the paparazzi that he sees around him are, are his mother's murderers. And so Meghan Markle has exploited that. Uh, that's her secret power to control Harry is to exploit his deepest, darkest fear. Yeah. He couldn't save his mother, and maybe he can't save his wife. Yeah, I mean, I think there may be some truth to that. Paul Burrell, what would, yes. what would Dinah have made it? What would she say to him? If she was still with us, Dinah, what would she say about the way Harry has taken his life and, and what he's been you know, doing it, to his family? You know, Piers, you knew the princess as, uh, as well, and you know that she would say to Harry, Harry, you, you should be... Uh, I applaud you for marrying for love. I applaud you for looking after your family, but you have to you have to abide by the rules. And Harry's rule was always to stand by his brother and to protect him, and she would be appalled. Mm. She would be absolutely appalled by this mess that's going on at the moment. Harry seems to be a victim. He seems to be... A, 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 a passenger on this train and it's going to end in tears and we all know it's going to end in tears and I don't want to see his heart broke again I saw it mm. once before and I don't want to see that happen to him yeah. I still love him he's Diana's boy and you know what can we do to try to save him I'm not sure that he can save himself no I think that's sadly that may be the case Simon finally he's got this court battle here over whether he should be allowed royal protection. Mm -hmm. If you were still working there, would you think that that's justified, that he should get that? Or should the British taxpayer be paying for that? It's extremely difficult. Everything has to be done on threat and risk. And that's one of the decisions that was made around that, as well as the role within the family. But I think when you go down the route of police protection being sold to the highest bidder. Mm. I think that is a problem. And one of the main problems is there's simply not enough protection officers. Right. So therefore, the people that would need it wouldn't necessarily get it because now they've been sold to the highest bidder. Yeah. Listen, thank you all. What a great panel. Uh, Miranda, Paul, Simon, thank you very much. Uh, all three of you very much indeed.